Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. This week, our building was full of over 200 kids and over 80 adult volunteers who are working to make our vacation Bible school happen. I hope that you can get a glimpse of the joy and experience that we had just by seeing some of the set that's still up. I hope this is a meaningful time of worship for you. I invite you now to take a big, deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be on your screen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you know us fully. You see our hearts and know our desires, and we can't keep any secrets from you. In this time of worship, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through the breath of your Holy Spirit so that we can perfectly love you and fully praise your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. God is love through humble service for the weight of human need Who upon the cross forsaken offered mercy's perfect deed We your servants bring to worship not a voice alone but heart Consecrating to your purpose every gift that you impart. Call by worship to your service, forth in your dear name we go. To the child, the youth, the aged, love and living deeds to show. Hope and health, good will and comfort. Counsel, aid, and peace we give That your servants, Lord, in freedom May your mercy know and live We come to the time now in our service where we have the privilege of going before God in prayer. Will you join me now as we pray? Triune God, we come to you this morning excited to worship you. When we look around the world, we see the evidence of your glory and your goodness. We also come to you this morning in great need. We need to encounter you, to be transformed by your love. Be with us now and hear these prayers. We pray for Christians all over the world. Holy Spirit, fall on us and transform us like you did at Pentecost. Work in us and enable us to will and work for your good pleasure. We pray for our country and for all the nations of the world. Guide us in the ways of justice and peace and help us to honor and serve each other. We ask for your blessing for our friends, our family, and our communities. Help us to serve Christ by serving them and help us love them like Christ has loved us. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in the midst of their suffering and bring them the joy that comes only from you. God, we thank you and praise you for your great love. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, who's still teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
As we transition now into a time of reflection and giving, I'd like to remind you that you can always give to the ministries of Wrightsville UMC through our website, our smartphone app, and of course, through the mail. Let us continue to worship the Lord our God. My name is Miss Courtney, and I had the pleasure of being the closing and opening assembly leader at this week's Vacation Bible School. We had so much fun at Pets Unleashed, where we learned how Jesus cares for us. Our Bible verse this week was, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Now, I have a question. Do you have a dog? Or do you maybe have a friend who has a dog or know someone in your neighborhood who has a pet dog? Me too. I have a dog at my house. Just like these. These are my sweet doggy friends. And you know, when you're a dog owner or you know a dog owner, you have a big responsibility. And that is to help keep your dog or any pet really safe and healthy. So my dog, Bo, he gets a little crazy. But when we go outside in our neighborhood, I can't just let him run wherever he wants. So I put on his collar and his leash, and then he stays by my side on the sidewalk so we can have a safe walk around our neighborhood to get some exercise. Another thing that my dog does, and I know a lot of yours might do too, is sometimes they try to eat things that they shouldn't, like a rock, or maybe a food that's not really for dogs, or even sometimes a piece of plastic. Now, as their owners, it's our job to help keep them safe and healthy. And so we have to get those toys or those rocks out of their mouth or out of the way and make sure they're eating healthy foods that are safe for dogs. My dog loves to eat his chicken and rice dog food, and sometimes we give him a little treat, but only treats that are for dogs. It's my job to help keep my dog safe as his owner. Now, this is really similar to how God cares for us. So sometimes we might wanna do things our way, but God always knows what's best for us, even if we don't know what's best for ourselves. Just like when I put my dog's leash on instead of just letting him run crazy. So there are times where you might think you know best and then you find out Maybe that wasn't the right choice, but you know who you can always go to is God. God's always there to help guide us through prayer and guidance because he's always here in our hearts. So for those of you who came to Vacation Bible School this week, thank you so much for being a part of this awesome week. And for everybody else, let's always remember that God cares for us. Let's say a prayer together. Dear God, Thank you for being our protector and for always helping us to stay safe and healthy. Help us to remember that we don't always know what's best, but we know that you do. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're taking time to worship with us here on The Vine, our online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Our sermon series continues with um, our look at the epistles or the letters of the New Testament. Um, last week we were at 1 Corinthians. This week we're in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer that way. So if anyone's in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the letters that were written so long ago that are still so poignant today as they teach us what it means to be a church and who we as individuals should be as disciples. Father, fill us with your word, and may we live out your word in our actions and in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the word made flesh. Amen. What is job number one in your life? When I was growing up back in the 1980s, the Ford Motor Company made it very clear what their primary job was. You remember their slogan? Quality is job one. What is job number one in your life? It's not all that bad a question to be asking at the beginning of summer. Of course, we get a lot of answers from our parents, from our teachers, from our politicians, even from our pastors. Job one might be parenting your kids or creating income for your family or getting good grades in school, loving your neighbor, taking care of your aging parents, or simply keeping your nose and all other body parts clean. The list is long. Of course, when you get inside the heads of individuals and move away from the alt-tos of authority figures to the real desires of a person, things change a bit, don't they? Job one for a child may be keeping her distance from that bossy Aaron out on the playground or finding a way to convince her parents to get her that new toy. Job one for a 16-year-old might be dressing right at school, getting a new car, or having something fun to do on Friday night. Job number one for an adult might be getting an advancement at work or surviving a terrible boss or dealing with a troubled marriage, teaching your children right from wrong. What is job number one for you? For me. Something to think about. Summertime's always been a time of reflection and learning, time to make some adjustments in our lives. But what kind of adjustments should we be making? I've been watching the College World Series this week, been rooting very hard for Wake Forest. In baseball, the word adjustment is used all the time. You hear the television announcers talking about it. You hear the hit hitters, the pitchers, the coaches talking about it too when they're being interviewed. I need to make adjustment in the way I release the ball, might a, a pitcher might say, or he's working on adjusting the position of his elbow as he brings the bat around, an announcer might say. The outfielder needs to make an adjustment to where he stands in the field in order to get out of the sun. We hear this word a lot. When I was playing baseball in high school, I had to make adjustments all the time. But imagine if my pitching coach told me, you know, Doug, you need to make an adjustment in your throwing motion, but then never told me what the adjustment was I needed to make. The coach might come up to me game after game after game, angry with me for not making the needed adjustment while I'm trying this, that, and the other, not knowing specifically what it is that I need to adjust. How much more helpful it would be if I had a skilled pitching instructor who communicated well with me, who would say, now Doug, you need to pull your right leg up higher in your windup and then push off the mound stronger with your left leg. There. Now I could try to do something constructive to improve my pitching. Likewise, I think that's one of the reasons we come to church. We come to improve, to make adjustments. We want to improve our relationship with God, our knowledge of God, our relationship with other people, especially those closest to us. The scripture we're looking at this morning is in the middle of a letter from St. Paul, that famous Christian missionary who wrote to a small, new, fledgling Christian house church that he started in Greece in the middle of the first century A.D. The letter, the second letter to the Corinthian church that has survived, was meant to encourage and correct this group of Christians. He first of all explains why he was unable to come visit them as soon as he promised that he would, and then he instructs them about the importance of forgiving people within the church who have sinned. And then he nails down just as clearly as he can what his and their job is as followers of Jesus Christ. 
what their job number one is. In chapter 5, he says clearly that the job of the Christian, the job given to all disciples of Jesus Christ, the job description that defines their task is this, to be representatives of Christ, to be his ambassador, doing what Christ did. And what is that? Was Christ known primarily for being moral and following all the rules? Well, not exactly. Not according to the religious folks of his day. He broke the Sabbath, broke with the traditions of his elders when it came to table manners. He talked with women and with Samaritans and with Gentiles. He ate with sinners. He saved a woman caught in adultery from being stoned to death. And he rubbed elbows with people who were unclean and shunned from the religious community. No, he was actually crucified for breaking the established moral and religious laws. So what was job number one for Jesus? Well, he was always breaking down any barrier that had been erected by human beings or by the religious establishment which kept people from God or from one another. Remember what he said to Nicodemus, as recorded in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. St. Paul understood this. The Corinthian church did not. In fact, they may not have even heard the Nicodemus story because this letter was written before the Gospel of John was written. So Paul writes just as fast as he can on some rough scroll paper, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Unless the Corinthian church not get it, he says it again, just in a different way. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. If our job number one in our walk with God is the work of sharing God's message of peace and reconciliation, of being ambassadors for Christ, doing what he did then, here and now, in our time, well, what then might that mean in the way we think about what adjustments need to be made in our lives this summer? Does this put a new perspective on our desire to drop a few pounds in order to look better in our bathing suits? I mean, we might feel better. We might even get healthier. But it's not job number one. What did Christ do? He taught, healed, worshipped, prayed, rested, and then forgave people of their sins, especially those who were deemed outcast or lived in the margins of society. St. Paul goes on in the very next chapter to say this, We don't want anyone to find fault with our work, and so we try hard not to cause any problems. But in everything and in every way, we show that we truly are God's servants. What does that mean? What does it mean to be truly God's servant? Never to cuss? To always make your bed? Never to talk back to your parents or your teachers? To know lots of Bible verses by heart? Not to eat food sacrificed to idols, as Pastor Julia explained last week? Well, each of these could be important if they were means to accomplish job one. But we've got to remember job one is helping to break down barriers between God and people and between people and people. Let me put it this way. God is using us to reach other people so that we can connect with God and with others as well. So we are like God's extension cord. God is the power source, right? We are the extension cord, and everybody we run into is like a lamp. A lamp that needs to be connected to the power source. God's the power source. We're the extension cord. Other people are the lamp. And once we're able to make that connection and get people plugged in, well then their light can shine so that all the world can see. This is our job. 
this is job one everywhere we go. Bringing the message of Christ's peace and reconciliation in how we act, in what we say, in what we do. Connecting with people, plugging them in. Now get this. St. Paul goes on in the next chapter to tell about all the trials and hassles he and his compatriots have gone through and that how they dealt with these crises were vital in their effectiveness in being valid, powerful witnesses to the kind of God that they serve, the kind of God they'd come to know in Jesus. So today, it might be that we ought to just go ahead and look at the way we deal with crises as they come up in our lives, both major and minor. It's easy to be people of peace when everything's going well. But can people see that we are believers and peacemakers and givers and forgivers when things aren't going so well? Does the way we handle our problems in front of our children and our spouse and our coworkers and our playmates at school reflect a closeness with God that others might like to come to know? Or do our lives look just as uptight and our responses to life's traumas just as hopeless and cynical and maybe even as mean-spirited as the next person's? What might we need to do to change from the inside in our relationship with God that might have an impact on how we relate to the trials that we face every day in this world? It might put a new spin on our life journey, don't you think? This week, of course, was Vacation Bible School Week here at church with more than 200 children and over 80 volunteers helping to teach those children about God. It brought to my mind the famous verse from 1 Timothy that gives our youth group their name 412. In verse, excuse me, in 1 Timothy, verse 412, chapter 4, verse 12, we read this. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That got me thinking back to when I was much younger, you know, maybe just a little older than some of the kids at Bible school. Back in middle school, in the good old days, I had the only air pump on the block, so I pumped up all the basketballs for all my friends in the neighborhood. One day, my good friend Mark, who lived around the corner, brought his basketball over to pump it up, I told him just go ahead and use the pump and blow up his basketball. And he did, and then he tossed the ball up and down in his hands. And After a couple of seconds, he gave me an inquisitive look. He said, Dougie Fresh, that's what people used to call me in middle school, Dougie Fresh. He said, uh, why do you spit on the needle? I said, well, it makes the needle go into the ball a little easier, and it keeps it from bending. He said, oh, okay. Um, I always spit on the needle, too. I just do it because you do it. I just always wondered why. His response kind of startled me. What else might people be doing simply because I do it? We've all got people like Mark in our lives. Somebody, a friend, a family member, a person we don't even know that's being influenced by our example. If we live as an example to others by following the example of Jesus Christ, then those who imitate us will be led to the light of Christ. Job one. What is your job one? Oh, we know we can't just try to put on a happy face to make a great witness for the Lord. People will see through that. But if whatever we do this summer to improve our health, our faith, our work-life balance, whatever, if it's not just for ourselves alone, but also for the purpose of witnessing to the gospel of Jesus Christ, if what we do this summer has that double purpose, then perhaps it might also draw from us a double effort. And we and those that we come in contact with will be doubly blessed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for reaching out to us. And for those that have helped us get plugged in, you help make the connection. Parents, grandparents, teachers, Sunday school teachers, friends. Lord, may we be that way to others. May we be an example, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, living as he lived, so that other people will 
know of your greatness, know of your love, know of your majesty and glory, your power. Lord, help us to be the disciples you've called us to be. In Jesus' name. Our power truly comes from God. Each person is someone who is perhaps living in darkness, but they just need a connection, an extension cord, a helping hand, an ambassador of Jesus Christ to help them see God's power. In the way that you live, help people get connected. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your Thank you.